Everybody, welcome to today's show. We are super happy to be joined by Nick Cook, who is an award-winning journalist. He is on the board for the Bigelow Institute for Consciousness Studies. He has written over 20 titles, directed two full-length feature films, and uh, the topics that he has covered are simply fascinating. So we're very excited to have him here today, and thank you all for joining us at home. Sit back and relax, and we'll be right back with Quantum Ladder Podcast. Welcome back to Quantum Letter Cop Podcast. My name is Louis Borges. Joining me as always, my good friend and co-host, Marquise Williams. What's up, guys? It's a pleasure to be here. I'm really excited about this interview. If you know where we come from, you know this is kind of like a salivating moment for uh, for this aspect of the of our investigation throughout our time on the internet. So I actually want to start off with a big question, but I'll I'll wait and see how you how you uh how you you gear us here here first. Yeah, this show is more <laughs> science and technology based, but again, we do come from the world of extraterrestrials looking at science you know could such a thing exist not getting too much in the lore and the myth of things but trying to have a factual based mind on things to, to really get some answers and explain and i've been fortunate enough and you have as well to interview some very high-ranking people who know a lot of stuff and uh, nick cook is no exception to that um, nick has reported on things such as secret weapons defense and security zero point energy global challenges uh, the future of technology so he's a fitting guest and uh, he works with some of the the highest end people in this field as well. Brilliant guy, super nice guy, and uh, we are very happy to have him join us today. So with that, warm welcome to our new friend, Mr. Nick Cook. Hello from England. Yeah, we are in the three different time zones right now to make this happen. So thank you everybody for uh, your commitment to this. And uh, thank you, Nick, it's been a long time in the making. But uh, persistence is key. And uh, I finally got you to, to, to find a slot and you know, we're doing this here so we're super happy to have you and um for anybody that's maybe not familiar with you or your work maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of what got you into the field of work that you're in now well thank you for first of all having me on the show it's great um for me to be here uh personally worth the wait so um thank you for for bearing with me um because we had a little trouble getting this together um it's quite hard to define, even for me sometimes, you know, what I am professionally. Um, I'm a writer. Uh, I, I'm a storyteller, obviously. Um, I was a journalist. Uh, I am a consultant. So I do technology consulting. I consult with companies on their sort of corporate storytelling, their corporate strategy. So I'm kind of, I do lots of things, but I like it that way because... <laughs> Maybe I have a sort of very uh, low boredom threshold, but doing all of these things keeps me busy and it keeps me curious. And uh, so, yeah, I, but probably first and foremost, I'm a storyteller. That's what I do. Hmm. My favorite thing of all time is storytelling, by the way. So that's awesome, you know? Um, and I, I did say I wanted to start this off with a big question. So please bear with me, Nick, on this one because, um, Usually we don't do this. It's like turning the whole thing upside down. If people knew what you knew about everything else, how would they feel? How would they feel? Well, that's a great question. Um, I've, I've not been asked it before, but my immediate response to that is I'm very cautious about what I think I know because I'm constantly updating 
um, myself, particularly on the subject of the phenomenon. I mean, by the mm. phenomenon, I'm talking about UFOs and UAP, but I'm also talking about the nature of consciousness and the nature of reality itself. It is really um, unwise, in my opinion, to have fixed positions about any of those things, because uh, I think the phenomenon itself is constantly changing and and uh, uh, it sort of um, it really doesn't like people to take fixed positions on it because it'll do something really surprising mm -hmm. to uh, shake your position on those fixed positions if you do. So I'm not trying to be flip in answering your question, Marquis. I guess I have learned things, though, over the past maybe five, five years, certainly, which have been eye opening to me. And actually, my own journey of sort of discovery, particularly about the phenomenon itself, and bear in mind, I'm a nuts and bolts guy. So I came from a tradition of really dyed in the wool, wool journalistic reporting. I reported, as you said in your introduction, on the world of aerospace, defense, technology, and weaponry. So, you know, those are pretty, those are pretty solid things. And then, so to have come from that world into the world of consciousness, um, using the lens of consciousness to look at the UAP UFO phenomenon and learn things about that phenomenon, which have surprised me greatly. I mean, that's been a fantastic journey for me. And, and you know, it, it going on. So um, what's the most surprising thing that I've learned along the way? I guess it is that non-human intelligence is a real thing. And, you know, I, I, I do like for all of my sort of hopefulness, trust and faith in things out there, I do like to have some stakes in the ground still. And, you know, when Congress came out, as it has over the last couple of years, to launch its own inquiry into UFOs and UAP and into the nature of non-human intelligence, you know, that has given me a sort of real-world certitude that it's not just me imagining things about this phenomenon. These things are real because, not least because, they are in the minds now of politicians and lawmakers. You know, and with my old journalistic hat on, I can go, okay, you know, this now is a real thing. And we can all sit up and take notice of it. So, sorry, long-winded answer to your question, but that's kind of where I am. You know, Not I was fortunate tell. enough about two yeah. years ago to interview George Knapp and Colin Kelleher about their uh, book, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Mm -hmm. And I considered myself a nuts and bolts guy. I was a science major in school. I didn't get too much into the sort of woo, as they call it, in this field. I wanted to keep it fact-based. And I really respected George Knapp and the work he did with Bob Lazar and everything else. And as the interview progressed, he starts going into the world of, like, consciousness and the hitchhiker effect and Bigfoot and orbs and, like, everything. And he's going, hey, I used to be the most nuts and bolts guy there is. And now you got to look at all this stuff. Uh, and both him and Colm did experience uh, hitchhiker effects. They had weird things happen after going to the ranch and uh, their minds were opened as a result of even investigating this type of thing. And a lot of people that they've spoken with had similar phenomenon. So, so what do you think it is about the phenomenon and particularly the hitchhiker effect that people that get into it or that visit haunted places or places with high strangeness, what do you think it is about that that carries along with people outside of that environment? Well, yeah, just to take that back a bit, um, as, as you said, Louis, you know, you come from that nuts and bolts tech science tradition, you know, which is what I come from. Um, so when I first sat up and took notice of the phenomenon really was in 2017. I mean, that's a pretty seminal date for a lot of people in yeah. this world because it was the the, in December 2017, that was when uh, the New York Times did its seminal story about um, ATIP, this uh, Advanced Aerospace Technology uh, Integration Program, is it? Um, that uh, or Investigation Program 
that, uh, the, anyway, the Pentagon's uh, UFO investigation body, which had been in secret existence for some time. You know, wow, okay, so despite its denials uh, for decades, the Pentagon has an office which has been looking at UAP or UFOs. So that enables, me, oh, and that is all confirmed too, subsequently. So that enables me to sit up and go, okay, I can look at this now without uh, the fear of that stigma which is attached to it because I started asking around various people I knew, even people in aerospace and defense, they had noticed this same article. They similarly felt some of the shackles that had prevented them from speaking about it removed. Um, so, you know, bit by bit, people came out of the closet, if you like, who'd had an interest in all of this before, who began to look at it and go, okay, so maybe maybe there's something to this. Um, I went from there to thinking, okay, so I come from a nuts and bolts tradition. I've done a bit of reading on UFOs. I hadn't done that much reading on them. Um, but what I did know, because I'd done a book on um, the hard tech aspects of secret exotic aerospace development, the book was called The Hunt for Zero Point, and it came out in 2001 in the UK, 2002 in the US. Mm -hmm. And that was my, The Hunt for Zero Point was my own um, attempt to investigate a tiny, tiny portion of the UFO phenomenon, which was, I didn't even see it in those terms, by the way. I just saw myself as investigating a, uh, a, a potentially highly secret um, aspect of aerospace and defense, which was a propulsion and energy breakthrough that would give you a kind of anti-gravity capability. Um, I'd taken that investigation as far as I could possibly go. So in 2017, I'm thinking, well, what can I usefully contribute to an investigation into UFOs? You know, I've done the nuts and bolts tech bit. So I thought, I think it's got to be related to consciousness. I'd read some books um, previously, a long time ago, actually, written by Jacques Vallée. You know, and Vallée's position was or is that um, there is much more to this phenomenon than simply mm. UAP or flying saucers, UFOs, call them what you will, penetrating our airspace. You know, this emerged for Valet out of a tradition that went back hundreds of years, which was associated with other phenomena like ghosts and, you know, fairies and mythology and, you know, mythical creatures. Uh, the way that perhaps we were seeing this modern phenomenon was just a twist on uh, an old take or a different take on an old phenomenon. So I thought to make a difference, I'm going to need to bone up on consciousness. But I knew absolutely nothing about it. This was in 2017, except for one thing, which was in 2014, I was at the bedside of my much loved dying mother-in-law when and actually i was there at the moment she died and my wife was holding her hand mm -hmm. and in the moment that she passed in the moment she, my mother-in-law died my wife who was holding her hand suddenly stood up and went all is well and i'm thinking very quietly to myself obviously we're all in shock and grief no, all is not well at all, um, my dear darling wife, because your mother has just died and you loved your mother very much. So what are you talking about? I then went you know, sometime later and, and, and asked her, I said, what did you mean all was well at that moment? She said, well, didn't you experience it too? And I went, what? And she went, well, I was in this place. It was infinite and connected. It was, I knew everything. Um, everything was good. It was love filled. Um, I'm, you know, and I'm thinking, this is my wife. We've been married for at that point, maybe 25 years. I know her really well. She doesn't make stuff up. Um, she's not super religious. I mean, she's quietly religious, but not, uh, to make pronouncements like this. So what is going on? Um, and I decided to investigate that thing. 
And it turned out to be something called a shared death experience. Mm. Um, and, and a shared death experience is a real thing. There's a, there's a phenomenon there. So that had tweaked my interest. I then wrote, I was so curious about it. Um, I wrote a, a book about it, but it wasn't nonfiction. It was a fiction book because I wasn't qualified to write it as nonfiction. I'm, what am I? I'm a nuts and bolts techie journalist. So that book came out in 2019. It was a thriller called The Grid, but it took consciousness as its substrate. And, but then it's, I, it still hadn't scratched that itch of curiosity about what consciousness and reality are. So uh, long story short, I was afforded the opportunity to uh, bone up on consciousness for about 18 months during lockdown. Somebody actually funded me to do it, a philanthropist. So I became from nothing super knowledgeable about consciousness. Um, I started to look into the nature of reality. I then wrote this essay that Robert Bigelow over at Bix um, had initiated to launch his Consciousness Institute. And the that essay was on, uh, the question was provide the best evidence for the nature, uh, for the, uh, for, um, provide the best evidence for proof of the reality of consciousness post death, you know, prove what happens um, that, that when we die, we, you know, we continue. And I thought, I can answer that question. I can, I've, I've learned enough over the last, whatever, mm. two years to be able to answer that question. So I submitted the essay to my surprise. I got a prize. Robert Bigelow then offered me a job on his Consciousness Institute as an advisor, which is what I still am. Um, and I'm getting to answer your question, finally, mm. which was, so all of that told me perhaps that, you know, a lot of us weren't looking at the question in the right way. For me, the question wasn't, why are these things intruding into our space, UFOs, whatever. It was, we haven't understood the space that these things are intruding upon. We don't understand the interface of our perception well enough to remotely understand what is going on with this phenomenon. So that is currently where I am. I am studying, if you like, that interface of our perception to, to better understand that, to give me clues then to the nature of the phenomenon by which I mean UFOs, UAP, non-human intelligence and related phenomena to better understand them. You know, I have, this makes me think of a pretty, I'm going to try to condense this next question into two parts. Um, the first part, I want to say, I've, I've, I've read Leslie Kane's books as well. She mentions as well the connection between consciousness and the phenomena in her interviews and her books. I, I do not quite understand. To me, consciousness is an abstract, right? It's, it's just this idea that doesn't have any, any physical substance to really tie it to. But there are expressions of what you could call consciousness. Um, you mentioned the experience with your wife and your mother-in-law. That is that is kind of a manifestation, or, or I guess an example of what consciousness represents, in, in a sense, like a part of it. Um, life after death, the, the the idea of of maybe abilities that people have, um, the experience of being aware of conscious, like being a conscious, aware individual, having an intellect. I do not understand that from the the perspective of of a practical perspective versus what it seems like is an abstract idea, consciousness. Um, if you could make sense of that for me and the audience here, that would be great because I've, I've, I've read so many things and I still don't get it. I don't understand. Um, and then, of course, you mentioned about this idea of us not understanding this medium or interface. Um, why does it why does it even I, I don't even understand why that even matters to understand it. If something is happening that is outside of our control anyway. Well, what are the implications for us, whether we understand it or not? OK. Great questions. Um, so deal with the first one first. Uh, well, you are an extremely good company about consciousness because no one understands it. I mean, <laughs> actually, the only thing that um, anyone understands about it is the one that you mentioned, which is that um, it is awareness. Mm -hmm. It is 
it, it, you know, the one, the only thing we can bank on in this world is that we are aware, um, and that uh, our awareness gives us our picture of the world. But is that the same picture of the world that you have? I don't know. No one knows. In fact, science. It was a big wake-up call for me when I realized, you know, after all my concerns about, you know my credentials not allowing me to investigate consciousness. I then learned pretty quickly that science does a ha doesn't have a handle on what consciousness is either. either. It doesn't understand where it comes right. from. Right. There are many, many theories, of course, but they kind of boil down into two versions. One is that we produce consciousness through, you know, electrochemical firings and, and, and reactions inside ourselves, in our, in our brains. That's the materialist perspective but then there is the there is another perspective which is that consciousness is pre-existent in the universe in our reality um and that somehow we download it much as a radio or a tv would from a you know like a signal so in other words our brains would act more like a an antenna um, in receiving the signal and that if you take the position which actually science does that the universe is primarily composed of information then you could conceive of a universe filled with information that we download in some shape way or form and along the way this thing sparks us into conscious awareness so you know that's the first point you're in great company. We're all in good company. No one understands what it is. But the, the position that mainstream science takes, which is that, you know, our brains effectively generate consciousness, unfortunately for me and increasingly for a lot of other people, doesn't take into account or explain what I consider to be outlier phenomena of consciousness. So UFOs, ghosts, cryptids, um, near yeah, how do you connect those? <laughs> yeah, I mean, all of these things which are dismissed by mainstream science as junk, woo, voodoo, all the rest mm. of it, you know, for me and many other people, it's actually, no, that is too easy to do that. Mm. If no one else but, but me or you or a handful of people had these experiences, you could dismiss it in those terms. But the fact is, millions of people have these experiences. Millions of people see UFOs. By the way, I don't think I ever have, but still doesn't make me not believe in them because the testimony of the people who report them actually is remarkably consistent across the board. And I'm someone who's trained to look at evidence. I might not have the scientific background, but I'm trained to look at evidence. And I go, this stuff is remarkably consistent across the board. So why is mainstream science dismissing it? I, you know, my curiosity alone doesn't allow me to take that position. So let's put the sort of placeholder down for the moment on the consciousness question, okay. and then go to the next one about what is the interface. So uh, I don't know what the interface is either. But what I do know is, is that, you know, even if we take the physical materialist position, that, you know, about how I see, for example, that, you know, my um, my picture of the world is generated by light bouncing off an object I'm looking at right now. I'm looking at a tree out this window and that through reflection and refraction, the picture generates upside down on my retina, which is then transposed by my brain's processing abilities into a coherent, visible picture. Fine. Um, but that doesn't explain how the atoms of this table that I'm sitting at, mm. which are 99.99999% empty space, why is this table solid? Why is it that, um, I, you know, I bang the table and my hand reacts against it? Well, yeah, you know, there's some electro magnetic reactive stuff going on between the atoms and the electrons in my uh, in my hand with the electrons and the atoms in the table. But that still doesn't explain what generates the solidity of my world. Right. Now, there is a, a great guy who really helped me 
formulate this, uh, this, this idea of the interface. Um, he's a cognitive scientist in California called Donald Hoffman. Um, he's at uh, UC Irvine. And he formulated this sort of very good analogy of a computer screen. You know, I'm talking to you now through the interface of my computer screen. On that screen, there are various icons. You're an icon. Um, you're an icon, Marquis. <laughs> so everything on my screen is comes to me through my interactions with an icon. But inside the guts of the machine, there's all sorts of stuff going on. Software, hardware programs, electricity running through it. I don't get to see those. In fact, um, I couldn't even begin to decipher them if I could see that stuff running around. But I do get to interface with those icons. Mm. And that, Hoffman says, is how reality is. We, through this magical conduit medium of consciousness, we formulate an interface of perception about mm. how we see the world. And that's how we deal with it. It's not the real world. Just as my computer is not really just composed of icons on my screen, it's got all kinds of things going on inside of it I never get to see or understand. Same with reality. There is, behind this screen of perception, all kinds of stuff going on at a subatomical level, through energies and forces we don't see, much less understand. And that is really the sort of the guts of the machine, if you can call the universe a machine, we never get to see that is building up behind this interface to give us this picture of reality. Now, if we don't understand that, and science doesn't, then how can it possibly understand the phenomena that appear upon that screen? Hmm. And, sort of, and that's really why, where I am. And maybe we can take it from there. That was, by yeah. the way, that was amazing. I've never thought of it the way Good that you answer. just presented it. So thank you for that. That, that was awesome. Yeah. You mentioned the uh, the numbers of people that have reported experiences. And like you said, if it was, you know, refined to a handful of people, you could say it's mental disorder or whatever, right? And in fact, John Mack looked at that. He thought, okay, well, maybe it, this is a new mental condition that hasn't been diagnosed. But upon doing his research and seeing similarities, even with children and everything else, he quickly ruled that out and agreed that there is, in fact, a phenomenon. Now, my question for you is I sort of get stuck on are these little gray men on craft coming trillions of light years across the universe to visit us or are they somehow already here? Is there like a thin firmament that they can penetrate? Is it just our limited spectrum that we don't see them all around us? Like you said, we're creating our reality. We're taking quantum information and running it through a physical system. We're very limited. So are these things just here and once in a while we can sort of interface with them or do you believe that they are actually beings from another part of the universe that have become advanced and have traveled back to see us may, may i add to that just for, just because i think this is a relevant addition to that question sure. um there was a reddit post early earlier this year about a, a, an alleged microbiologist i believe who posted about the studying the uh, a body and these bodies that were essentially about uh they were created organisms essentially yeah. Um, and, and, and Gary Nolan had essentially given credence to at least studying this microbiologist post on Reddit that this, the, that the phenomena is, is not just these beings specifically in relation to the phenomena may be created organisms like artificially intelligent organisms that have a mix between different um, organisms native to this planet that something else is using to interface with us. So in addition to that question, I wanted to kind of give, kind of add to that and see if maybe you can, yeah. Well, okay. So, uh, Louis, the, the short answer to your question is yes and all of the above, I think. <laughs> and the only reason I'm, I feel you know, one can say that is because, again, if we don't understand that interface of reality, anything that appears on that becomes possible. Sure. So, and its origins become possible. You know, I started out like a lot of people thinking that extraterrestrial or non-human intelligence, I mean, actually, we've only recently sort of adopted that non-human intelligence term, but let's say extraterrestrial. Extraterrestrials 
if UFOs were real, then chances were this, these, they were extraterrestrials visiting this planet from other star systems. In fact, you know, if you sort of read between the lines of a lot of investigation um, on Capitol Hill, there are still quite a few people who seem to hold that position still. You know, that fundamentally we are looking at beings from other star systems coming here in exotic spacecraft that somehow managed to, you know, bend space and time to get here or travel at faster than light speed, which of course, mm. by our physics is impossible. Yeah. So al already you're sort of putting up a bit of a, a sort of block between you and what this phenomenon could be. Um, but actually, again, if you go back to this idea of an interface um, and there being depths of reality behind this interface that we as humans never get to see, at least not customarily, then you can begin to conceive of other forms of non-human intelligence beyond the ones that come here in exotic interstellar spacecraft. So increasingly, I take the view that if we study this interface and if we go behind it, then we will become aware of forms of non-human intelligence that span a huge spectrum, you know, and that spectrum could be from, I mean, you know, literally on, on the sort of material end of non-human intelligence, there is animal intelligence from this planet. There's mm. artificial intelligence from this planet. Um, there are then uh, literally um, interdimensional forms of non-human intelligence, which may be penetrating through this interface occasionally to manifest as in physical form, um, or at least physical form as we understand it on this side of the interface. So I think there are um, all kinds of, uh, many different kinds of entities, if we can call them that, um, or non-human intelligence, that um, we are only now beginning to acknowledge in that, again, me as a nuts and bolts died in the wool hack, um, as we call journalists this side of the pond. Um, uh, you know, I come from that tradition where I, I, I want to see proof. But increasingly, I'm hearing that term non-human intelligence used in governmental circles uh, and in Pentagon circles on your side of the pond. So that gives me a little sort of, you know, buffer of comfort that uh, I'm not the only one. We're, we aren't the only ones you know, thinking about this stuff and talking about it. Um, on the question of, you know, these created organisms, well, you know, again, who knows, but why not? Um, it, it, it's entirely possible, for example, that, you know, some of the entities that I think appear on this interface are either forms of artificial intelligence developed elsewhere, or they may be kind of avatars for real beings who could just use some physical form or shape, the shape of a body or a human or a quasi human to appear in our reality. Um, who knows? I mean, it could be any and all of the above, but to dismiss this stuff, you know, from here on in, as just non-worthy of study is, in my opinion, all wrong. It's, um, and it appears to be becoming increasingly prevalent. So does that mean that there are, you know, the filters on this screen of perception that we're talking about, are they in some way, shape or form dissolving a little to allow more of this stuff to come through? Because it certainly seems that way to me and quite a few people I speak to. But again, one has to be careful because, you know, just because I've started studying this phenomenon only relatively recently, um, does that mean that I'm just, you know, suddenly becoming aware of all of these things as if they are becoming more prevalent? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but I, you know, there is certainly something, um, uh, 
I think we all feel a little destabilized at the moment. You know, there's so much weird stuff going on in the world, disturbing stuff like, you know, we have two major conflicts in the world raging as we speak. You know, that is very destabilizing. You could almost say it, it, it ripples out into reality as a destabilizing factor and force. So um, it may well be that this veil of perception that has served us very cogently for, you know, many thousands of years is perhaps dissolving into something a little more fluid that is allowing some of this, some of these stranger outliers of consciousness, you know, whether they be ghosts, cryptids, crypto, cryptozoological creatures, or UFOs, to appear in what we consider to be our reality. But like I say, I consider our reality quotes to be a very fluid and misunderstood thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Go ahead, Marquis. Sorry, I, um, I'm going to try to focus here because I have like 4,000 questions based off that last thing you just said. So I'm just going to cut to the chase because we don't have, I don't, I don't want to waste any time. Does Leslie King has mentioned um, that she has concerns about the phenomena. If, if when I, when I look at the, in the content that's been, you know, put out there by you, by George Knapp and others about the phenomena, especially Skinwalker Ranch and so forth, there are two things that come to my mind, two things. One, the phenomena isn't just passively appearing at random for no specific purpose. It seems to be directly or intricately involved in human affairs um, and has been for, if you believe in old religious texts, thousands of years. They've been gods, they've been demons, they've been angels, they've been everything. Fairies, you know, um, allegedly throughout his human history. They don't seem to be passive, you know, or just an, just a, a, a random anomaly they seem to be if in jock Valais words I, I should be careful about this because he didn't you know um there's a control mechanism possibly being used to direct humanity towards some end and when you mention about this interface this filter being uh lessened or weakened or dissolving it some for in some in whatever sense uh that makes me wonder what could that mean for us does that mean that they will that the gods will come back and it's this is a i feel ridiculous for saying this but does that mean the phenomena, whatever it may represent truly, will eventually be more explicit in not only its presence, but its intention? And, and is that, is that, should that be a concern? Because even Leslie Kane says she's concerned about, you know, in relation to the phenomena um, for humanity. Well, I, I know Leslie quite well. She's, um, you know, she's a fantastically uh, and deservedly so well-respected journalist, uh, you know, and we, we, we talk quite a bit. Um, so, uh, anything that she brings up, uh, it, you know, in those question terms, you know, is, is, is extremely valid. Um, I don't know the answer to that Marquis, you know, and I wish I did, but what I do sense is that, um, you know, again, and, and <laughs> I can't believe sometimes I hear myself saying these things, um, given where I've come from, but, you know, my sense is that you know, we've become so materialist as humans. You know, we we have put our faith in technology and our trust in technology. We have left behind traditions of spiritual awareness, of, you know, of, of spiritual care, both of, you know, ourselves and of other people that, you know, I'm, I'm really tempted to say, and in fact, you know, I will say that, you know, when we approach these questions and particularly, you know, about questions surrounding cognition and how we perceive things on this interface, I think we need to approach this interface with great reverence, it, with a sort of a reverence that our forebears um, came to approach their reality mm. in, you know. We know from you know civilization, the dawn of civilization, that gods were important to these um, these people, you know, our our ancestors, and, and continued to be for you know hundreds, if not thousands, of years, until we all suddenly got very civilized in the mm. uh, 
16th and 17th centuries. And we decided that separation of mind and body a la Rene Descartes was a really good thing. You know, Descartes said, no, we need to split out the spiritual side of us and, and, and the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 our devotion to same from the physical side of us. And, you know, that almost gave birth really to a sort of um, church and state enterprise where the church would take care of religion and the state would take care of everything else, including science. And these two things became very separate. Um, I think that as we reintegrate um, consciousness into the equation of all of this, we need to bring back some of that respect and reverence for the things that we don't know about and we don't understand. And actually, if we do that, um, we might restore some balance in the world. You know, I mean, as we discussed earlier, it really feels at the moment like the world has somehow tilted off its axis. Mm. We've got all of this chaos going on. Um, and some of that, in fact, a lot of that needs to be restored. And more than that, we if we're going to progress as a civilization, you know, as humanity in the third decade of the third millennium going forward, we've got to, you know, rethink a whole lot of things where our mind, a whole lot of areas in which our mindset has become stuck, you know, and actually armed conflict is one of them. Is this really how we should be settling disputes at this time, you know, through fighting guns, weaponry and all the rest of it? Um, well, I think if we, as we approach science and awareness in a new light going forward, all of these things come back onto the table. And as we approach this uh, uh, interface of perception um, and, 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 and endeavor to learn and discover what it is then I think we should do that with a certain amount of reverence uh, or respect, perhaps, mm. is a better word. Uh, and um, so, you know, sometimes when these phenomena appear, um, I mean, I don't know, but, you know, I, I, I sometimes think that it, there's a reflective quality to it. If you're poking the phenomenon, it's probably going to poke you back um, or it might do. So... You know, it gets back again, Louis, to your question about um, what are we seeing? You know, are these entities from other star systems or are they already here? You know, and again, I would answer that with I don't know, but I think somehow it's all of the above. Yeah, very well said. And with that, we're at the halfway point of today's show. So we're going to take our five minute break and we'll see everybody back here in just a few on Quantum Ladder Podcast.
And we are back with the second half of Quantum Ladder Podcast. Joining us today is the brilliant Nick Cook. And uh, thanks again, Nick, for doing this. We really appreciate it. First 50 minutes just flew by. And uh, we know uh, we have uh, probably about another 40 minutes to go here. So we'll keep it uh, concise and to the point. So we were chatting about, you know, various ideas on the phenomenon, what it could be. We're all humble enough to say we don't know, which I think is the right answer. Anybody out there saying it's definitely this or definitely not this or they're all friendly or they're not. I mean, we don't know. So we have to be humble in our in the way we, we approach these type of questions. But I want to ask you, you've done a lot of work with people in the Pentagon and you write about top secret programs and things like that. What about the disinformation or misinformation, depending on what side of the fence you're on? I mean, if you take the government's word for it, there was nothing. Nothing happened at Roswell. They looked mm-hmm. into it briefly and then nothing after 1969. And then you come to learn that really that research never ended even into the days of like NIDS with Bigelow and then OSAP, ATIP, now Arrow. So give us your insights on sort of the government's stand on this. You know, have they been just sort of keeping it quiet for our own good or because they don't know? Mm-hmm. Has it been deliberate? Mm-hmm. What do you think? Uh, good question again. And my, my short answer to your question is yes, all of the above. Yeah. But OK, let's dive into that a little bit now. I need to qualify this with, I haven't actively reported on this world for 15 years, okay? I maintain a weather eye on it, so it's of interest. However, I can answer it from the position of where I was as a defense editor for um, nigh on 20 years, I mean, 15 or so years. Um, So I was, the aerospace editor of a magazine called Jane's Defence Weekly, premier sort of um, defence magazine based in the UK, global reporting mandate. Um, One of the biggest stories that I covered during the 1980s or late 80s and early 90s uh, was stealth, the emergence of stealth as a technology. Stealth was a breakthrough technology and was hushed up for years. but actually resulted in an aeroplane, the stealth fighter, uh, going into squadron service for five years unacknowledged, which is yeah. extraordinary. Mm. But th- these things were flying around in the desert in Nevada and elsewhere, um, and, and they weren't meant to exist. So we were aware as uh, reporters and editors of a very subtle sort of uh, disinformation campaign to negate the uh, existence of these aircraft. Um, and over time, as the 1990s sort of drifted on, I, I became aware of further um, obfuscation uh, and active disinformation. And that was when um, the CIA, amongst others, came out and, and admitted that during the 50s and 60s, it had used UFOs as a smokescreen for what it was doing back then with high flying spy planes like the U-2 and the Blackbird and stuff. So we have precedent for this, you know, and and admitted precedent from the DOD and others and intelligence agencies that UFOs have been used as a smokescreen of disinformation for high technology secret programs. So it is no stretch to imagine that that same thing is going on today, but it just morphs into a different form. So, you know, for example, uh, whistleblower David Grush um, appears before Congress. He um, makes certain statements about the phenomenon. Um, I don't know whether they're all true or not, but People tell me reliably that, you know, he's a stand up guy. And in fact, you know, most of the testimony you see would seem to support that. This guy has nothing to gain pretty much and everything to lose from the statements he has made. And yet he has made them under oath um, before Congress and de facto to the world. what you then sort of have started to see, I think, is a bit of a what I call a, call a sort of walk back campaign by officialdom to go, hmm, um, OK, so we started to sort of loosen the bottle top uh, on this whole disclosure thing. We released some pressure 
uh, by uh, making certain admissions about um, the phenomenon to wit in 2021. I'm sure you both remember the the Pentagon and the intelligence community issued a joint report about uh, the, the, the phenomenon. It was the first time that they'd actually officially admitted that UFOs were real. And that means as a real phenomenon. They didn't say what they thought they were, but they said that this is a real thing. And that was the sort of first, or one of the first sort of releases of that disclosure pressure. But it seems as if, particularly with you know, rampant um, activity on Capitol Hill and elsewhere in the last few years, certainly, that um, someone somewhere or perhaps uh, uh, you know, institution somewhere have decided that all of this is going a little too fast for their liking and they need to put a little, uh, 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 you know, they need to turn the screw on the, uh, on the bottle top and, and put that pressure back into the bottle because enough disclosure has come out for the time being. And you get that sort of sense of a walk back, um, not just in the media, and there is some of that, although actually I'm enormously impressed that uh, increasingly the media, the mainstream media is taking, you know, a, a much more open view than it certainly did in the past on, on the nature of this, this phenomenon and, and this question. But even so, you can still see pockets where this walk back campaign is happening. And, you know, as, as a former journalist, I mean, I was embedded in a press corps here in the UK, which was attached to the Ministry of Defence. So um, there were, you know, there were a group of us, I don't know, there was maybe 20 or 30 members of that corps. And you were fed official information. Uh, and that official information becomes your bread and butter. Um, you, uh, you, your, your, your credibility stands or falls depending on whether you are able to access those sources, official sources of information. And if that official source of information is cut off for any reason, you know, your editor is going to turn around to you and go, well, you're not much used to me anymore, Cook. Yeah. So, um, you know, sling your hook and we're going to get somebody else in. All of that must be going through the minds of people who report this stuff. It is not easy to report it. I get it. Um, I came from that tradition. Um, but uh, so, yeah, I think I think there is a lot of disinformation that's flowing around. It is subtle. Some of it is very insidious. Um, some of it is very active, but it's there. And by the way, I think it is all feeding into this sort of um, reality matrix that we've been talking about. It's making that interface on which we perceive reality really squirrely. And uh, it's not even sometimes about active disinformation. I mean, the mere fact that you can get so much fake news on uh, in, in, in social media, that is also, you know, querying the patch in terms of, you know, what is real and what is fake. So it is becoming increasingly hard. Whatever you're looking at, whether you're looking at UFOs or just ordinary news to determine what is real and what is fake. And, and I don't know what the answer to that is. I mean, people ask me occasionally, you know, how do you, so what do you do? You know, who do you trust? What sources of information do you trust? And I think the only thing that, I mean, that, 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 that I could respond, I do respond by saying is, and this is me as a former journalist, don't trust any single source of information. Um, you have to go out there, get curious and find out yourself and, and make value judgments on what you think is going on based on what you, uh, you discover. But, you know, I'm tempted to go like Fox Mulder in the X-Files, trust no one. No, 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 yeah. you know, trust people, but learn to, learn to trust your sources of information and then decide for yourself. Yeah. What about the quick idea here? Uh, just a real quick, Marquis, that um, the phenomena is preventing disclosure. Many oh, people are I saying the reason we're not getting the truth <laughs> is they're infiltrated yeah. and they're the ones that are preventing this. Or, you know, when it does trickle out, it is at their discretion. They're in charge. This is their big plan. What do you think on, you know, that type of idea? 
Well, I'm, I'm going to, of course, I'm going to caveat this with, I have no idea. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, you know, I'm very taken with and have long been taken with, you know, Jacques Vallée's thesis of a control system of a, of a, you know, th th there being um, entities, uh, whether those are, you could call them individual entities, non-human intelligences, or maybe even an overarching intelligence mm. um, that is manifest in our Multiple. reality, yeah. that is controlling in some way, shape or form how we perceive our reality. Mm. That is that is that that is certainly a possibility. Um, I, I, I don't know whether the phenomenon intervenes, but occasionally I see things or I glimpse things that make me wonder if it is. And to give you an example, um, beginning of the year, you know, we'd had certain levels of disclosure going on in Capitol Hill, um, certain blocking maneuvers that had been going on in the ways that we've been talking about. And then lo and behold, what happens? The Chinese send a balloon across the country mm. inadvertently. They didn't mean to, but it just happened. And we go, sorry, you guys, I'm quarter American, by the way, so I <laughs> often think of myself as American. Um, we go and shoot down um, the balloon, the Chinese balloon. It's a genuine Chinese spy balloon. Um, and that we think is the end of the matter. But over subsequent days, three more objects mm -hmm. shot down and those objects have not been accounted for. There are various statements that have been put out to say, oh, you know, they were um, enthusiasts, balloons used for taking, I don't know, weather measurements and um, with radio beacons on them. Really? You shoot them down with an F-22 mm -hmm. and an yeah. AIM-9X missile? Half um, a million dollar missile. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, and, and in the meantime, you can't really account for the wreckage and any of that any stuff. Of yeah. You know, I, I've covered the sophistication of the U.S. armed forces for a very long time. And that, for me, stretches the bounds of plausibility a long way. Yeah. So I then tease myself with the notion that this may be the phenomenon playing with us. And if you accept this Donald Hoffman view that, you know, our reality is just icons on a screen, um, anything becomes possible on that screen. What we consider real, I mean, solid objects are they're, they're just those icons on a screen. So um, the balloon, the Chinese balloon was obviously, quotes, real. The other things were. Well, they sort of mimicked the balloon, but I think there's more to them than meets the eye. So was this the phenomenon saying, you think you're clever? I mean, you know, collectively, um, you know, U.S. government or uh, the U.S. security infrastructure. You think you're very clever. You think you can shut this discussion down. Um, but we're going to make it a little more complicated for you. We're going to, you know, we're going to manifest a phenomenon not unlike the Chinese balloon, but um, but but uh, mysterious. And, you know, uh, we're going to leave that as sort of pieces of, of, of jigsaw and pieces of evidence that people can go figure out at a later date. By the way, no one has yet. Um, but as far as I can make out, I mean, certainly the mainstream media hasn't. I mean, no. if I were a journalist still, I'd be really tempted to want to go and follow that story to source, but it hasn't really been. So, um, yeah, I think there's all kinds of interference that goes on. And I think that we can say that uh, with some increase in confidence based on, again, this, you know, uh, this idea of this interface and how little we understand this interface of perception. So. Yeah, I think the world's getting um, weird and um, it's getting weirder by the day. So, you know, yeah. God knows what's going to happen next. Yeah, and that's why we're here. That's why we exactly I I'm going to 
I'm going to go there, okay? Because you, you said a couple things that they're going to make me, you kind of force me into this uh, position that I'm in right now. And so entertain me, speculate. Um, I, I have been following this for a couple of years. I'm not as I'm not an OG like a lot of people are, are with the UFO topic. I have had experiences. I don't like to talk about it because I feel like it's irrelevant personally to, to my investigation. But I, I listened to Alessandro, for example, mention in an, in a, an interview where he said that the, the government or the Department of Defense may be keeping this information suppressed for the good of the public. And, and what he expressed was that there could be an action predicated because of, uh, because of telling people the phenomena may have been planning something. And because people are aware of the phenomena globally, and you know, there's a, there, the consciousness is there, the awareness is there, they may not wait potentially 50 year plus years or so to do something. They may do something tomorrow, and we don't have any kind of preparation for or even understanding of what the heck this is. And so whatever they want to do, whether it be good or bad for us, we're going to be subject to their whim, whim entirely. Um, I've also listened to Grush mention the fact that there well, the idea that there, there have been deals made. Let's just let's just go here, okay? I'm gonna I'm gonna speculate with me that there have been deals made with non-human intelligences and the government or the military or some element of that of that that you know conjunction there. The idea that <laughs> the idea that Pio Lavenda talks about sinister forces, the idea that there are these there is a phenomena that is literally infiltrated elements of the U.S. government um, and everywhere in, in human civilization to manipulate us for their own aims in not so pleasant ways. Um, all of these things, all of these people have really, and I, I'm like you, I, I take the Jacques Vallée perspective, but I've also listened to, you know, I've really been influenced by Peter, Peter Lavenda, heavily by Elizondo, 2000, again, 2017 is when I got involved in looking at this. And I am personally, I'm not, uh, and I've, I've, the biggest reason why we left the UFO field is because of the vitriol the toxicity. Um, I do not think the phenomena is a pleasant thing. Doesn't mean they're going to come wipe us out or that's going to kill us all or whatever. I don't see it being a pleasant thing for humanity, even if to protect itself from us, um, because we seem to be a terribly violent species. I don't see the, 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 the phenomena, the veil being thinning uh, or the veil thinning being a good thing. I don't see us, even if George Knapp mentioned that, that it might not be a good thing to tell the public about the whole truth i am citing more on the that kind of thinking than tell everyone find out what's going on and let everybody know hey this is what what it is because maybe something bad will happen as a consequence of us becoming fully aware of the phenomenon well uh a lot to un unpack there for sure um so uh you know again i come from that aerospace and defense background so um there is a great part of me, or at least a part of me, that gets um, Lou Elizondo's position, um, which is, we don't know what this is. Well, at least I think this is his position. We don't know what this is, so we need to exercise caution. Um, and he and others, uh, rightly from the position of a threat analyst, are looking on this in threat analytical terms where you gauge primarily two things, uh, capability and intent. Capability is clearly there. We know um, the, uh, you know the, the capability of some of these craft is phenomenal. Um, not only can they uh, move with extraordinary speed, they have stealth capabilities. They appear to be able to shut down um, offensive and defensive you know, missile systems with impunity, that's capability. Um, then there's the other half or the other part of the equation, which is intent. We don't really know the intent. So if I were a threat analyst, it would be my job to exercise due caution and err on the side of playing it safe, which is these things may be a threat. So we need to treat them for the moment as one potentially. Um, I, I, I do think, though, and we may have touched on this earlier, that there is an element of what you bring to the interface, um, it is going to reflect back at you. Um, there is that expression, I can't remember, is it Nietzsche's, which is, um, 
if you stare into the abyss, the abyss will stare abyss. back at you. Yeah. So uh, there may be an element, there may be an element of, of that here. And, you know, certainly um, there is uh, uh, anecdotal evidence that, you know, nasty things can and occasionally do happen to people from this phenomenon. Um, but, you know, I also think that if the f maybe we should take the phenomenon's position for a moment and go, I think you mentioned it, Marquise, you come here or maybe you already live here. I mean, in that you are right. existing alongside us in some dimensional reality and you see what we are doing to each other and you go, these people don't give a shit about themselves. <laughs> yep. So why should we? And, you know, that, that I think there is no single answer in any of this. You know, you, you brought up the names of two people who are immensely respected in this field, in Elizondo and Lavender. Um, and I wouldn't take positions against either of them. You know, I think they speak a great deal of sense. Of course, they've been looking at this phenomenon for a very, very long time. Um, but I tend to be a bit more hopeful um, in my prognostications. I believe that we can't, um, we're not in wholly in charge of this. We may not even be in charge of any of it. So to deny it by going, you can't tell people because actually that's just gonna make things all the more destabilizing. I get why governments would do that. I get why intelligence agencies and defense ministries and departments would do that. But as we've already noted, there may be a part of this thing which is driving disclosure itself. And every time we try and shut it down by you know, closing the lid of that bottle and you know, trapping the pressure buildup inside, it just finds another way of coming out. And, and you know, that might just be what we're dealing with here. This is consciousness somehow um, acting on us through itself, through this interface, shifting reality to make us what? We don't know. More aware, more self-aware, more caring. Does the phenomenon care about us? Um, you know, we, we, we don't know the answers to this question or any of these questions, but my intuition, my gut is telling me that we cannot approach this field, this phenomenon, using the tools that we, of investigation that we've used in the past mm. and using the mindsets that we have used for 400 years, more, you know, that, that dualistic mindset of there's mind and there's body, there's church, there's state, there's, there's, there's spirituality and science. No, we've got to, we've got to fundamentally reframe, I think, how we see ourselves, how we see the world, and how we see things beyond the screen of our perception or the world of our perception, to be curious about what might lie out there, be out there, but cautiously curious. And as I said earlier, my instinct is we need to approach this with some respect and reverence. Mm -hmm. and, and that doesn't sound very scientific and scientists aren't gonna like it, but that's not to say we shouldn't use the tools of science on it. It's just that we, 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 we can't just use the tools of science alone. We need to, I think, be more, more, more caring and nurturing of yeah. ourselves and of our planet before we, um, you know, before we tackle these huge questions simply um, through the lens of science and technology alone. I, I do want to be clear, Elizondo, just, I, do, I don't want to misrepresent. He he said that is the position of the DOD. Like you just mentioned, they're cautious for because that's the kind of their, the nature of the DOD, the Department of Defense. Its nature is to defend. 
Um, he said that is their position. He doesn't agree. He does believe we should know because I think uh, somewhat in conjunction with what you said, he, he thinks that by us knowing it could help us. So I, I just want to be clear, like d disclosure is a good thing in his mind. And he wants to push for disclosure, um, which is why I respect, I've always respected him from the beginning. Sure. Yeah, me too. Um, no, absolutely. He is merely um, stating the official position. Yeah, right. I wanted to ask you, because <clears throat> again, you're a techie guy, material science guy. When I, uh, you know, got into this, I thought, well, okay, is there any physical evidence, something that like the public could have access to, or are there artifacts roaming around out there? And I was fortunate enough to interview Gary Nolan about a year and a half ago. <clears throat> this was before his SALT conference, where he basically let it all out. Yeah. But I had asked him, I said, hey, I've heard that there's these things called arts parts from the Art Bell Show, little bits, fragments of UFO that have a weird crystalline nature. They're like, you know, nano layers of bismuth and magnesium. No. There's no apparent reason why you would make this stuff. The cost would be astronomical. And as I'm talking to him, he disappears off camera. <sighs> so I'm still kind of formulating my question. And then I finally got to a point where I didn't have anything else to say. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, are you grabbing something? What? This is yeah. the middle of a show. <laughs> and he pulls it up and he's like, yeah, you're talking about this stuff right here. And I couldn't believe he had a physical remnant of that yeah. with him. And, and uh, so I asked yeah. him and he kind of gave me an aloof answer. I said, you know, is this piece of a UFO? And so then I gave him the other and I said, OK, I know you can't say because of your position, but have you been told or do you believe that we, the government, somebody is in possession of exotic material that did not originate on planet Earth? And he just looked at us and, and said, yes. And that was just like jump yeah. out of your seat because yeah. this guy just acknowledged that that's a friggin piece of a UFO. And the amazing thing to me is sort of, you know, the things Bob Lazar talked about, the propulsion. You look at the characteristics, UAP display, turning on a dime, even Elizondo with the five observables. Yeah. No yeah. propulsion, no heat, no flaps or control surfaces, yeah. instantaneous, instantaneous propulsion, hypersonic, velocity. you know, hypersonic, like over 3000 miles an hour. No problem. 10,000 you know, sometimes. Yeah, and then when yeah. you get somebody like Gary Nolan talking about this structure, and then I talk to other people who are into metamaterials and you know metallurgists and stuff like that, and they basically say, yeah, it could in theory produce a waveform, and maybe that's how these things manipulate you know our space and don't really behave with the same laws of physics. That's why they don't need all these things that we do. So, what are your thoughts on actual artifacts that may exist and metamaterials more specifically? Yeah, I, I got to add to that because I think this is – I watched a documentary, James Fox's documentary, uh, where Jacques Vallée and Gary Nolan were together working on the metamaterial. And the one thing they mentioned that – again, I'm not a scientist. I just – as a layperson, when I hear this, it makes me think it's obviously not us. That the metamaterial, it, it had isotopic ratios that were right. just bizarre. Not and from that, this planet. The, not, from, not from this solar system from what yeah. I understand. They said that this, it's not even from the solar system. And that also – um, that it was made outside of our of, of, of planet Earth, and that the, Gary Nolan made a comment. I'm going to try to rephrase this. We make the world out of 80 elements. Somebody's making the world out of 250 plus isotopes. Yeah. What are the implications of that? <laughs> well, so yeah, coming from my tech nuts and bolts you know tradition um there's nothing like a bit of technology to sort of you know ground you um i remember i think shortly after the new york times 2017 story came out um i was visiting the laboratory of hal putoff dr hal putoff who mm -hmm. you know i'm sure you guys yep. uh know you know he's often you know lauded rightly so i think as you know one of the foremost experts on you know kind of exotic technology and uh propulsion technology and so forth um so uh i was in his laboratory and he showed me a piece of stuff and he said this is purported to be a metamaterial from something we don't know what it is but it's composed of you know and subsequently i think it found its way to ttsa you know yeah. to the stars academy and tom DeLong's um outfit uh so, you know, maybe I was gazing upon an artifact from an exotic craft of some description. You know, now, expand that out. Do I think that uh, there is technology in basements of 
companies and laboratories scattered around the country. In fact, you know, in, and not just in the US, but in other parts of the world that may be, you know, either off planet or uh, uh, exotic to the degree that they don't come from some terrestrial, you know, human program. Um, well, for, you know, for years, I thought that was impossible. Um, I wrote this book, The Hunt for Zero Point, which was sort of looking at the, the flip of that question, which was, could we humans have developed technology that um, is so exotic that it would perform like a UFO? Uh, I don't want to spoil the end of that book because it is written a bit like a thriller <laughs> deliberately. Um, but, you know, I get to the end of that, having learned a lot of things, but the one thing I did not have was smoking gun evidence that we had created that breakthrough. Um, I, over the years and quite recently, I've sort of refined my own view on that, which is that I think it is highly likely that we have recovered um, non-human intelligently derived artifacts of craft that they may either be parts or complete crafts. One hears the law that they do involve complete craft. Um, I, I find it harder and harder to, to just reject that evidence or rather that testimony I, uh, increasingly hard. And, and part of that is based on my sort of knowledge of how that world works, or at least, you know, uh, certainly how the parts of it work that developed highly classified aircraft technology. It is not too much of a stretch for me to imagine that, you know, several layers down, further down from the most secret aircraft you can imagine, there is um, tech being worked on that is, you know, truly exotic. Uh, and so that's sort of where I am now. Yeah, I have not closed my mind to that possibility. In fact, uh, I'd be surprised now if we haven't recovered those, uh, those craft or bits of them uh, and are trying to exploit them. Um, and, and again, you know, I wouldn't be the first person to say this. I know Gary Nolan has himself, which is how insane is it, you know, when okay, I get the part about this conferring military value um, and technological value. We are in a, an arms race, um, mm -hmm. sadly, with uh, Russia and China, uh, wherein they too, undoubtedly, are trying to acquire this same technology, if they haven't already. And I suspect it's highly likely that both of them have. So, you know, on the one hand, it's crazy that in, again, the third decade of the third millennium, we are covering this stuff up, even though it ha may have qualities in it that could, quote, save the planet. You know, if there is a, 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 a propulsion or energy breakthrough associated with it. Um, but at the same time, of course, you know, that other half of me recognizes that that same technology, given a bit of tweaking, becomes the most potent weaponry you can conceive of. And we are in an arms race. I get that. But we've got to find a way around this. And, and I think Gary and certainly others have you know, said it is not going to come through looking at this through a stovepipe of military thinking. It is going to the breakthroughs and the exploitation breakthroughs are going to come from an enlightened whole of science approach. Um, where not just the military or the uh, intelligence community is you know, holding this stuff very close held and going, we've got to hang on to this and analyze it ourselves. And you, you hear anecdotally uh, that associated with that, they are stymied. They cannot figure out how it works. Well, you know, if there is a, a consciousness derived aspect of of um in other words putting a human or no, rather an intelligence in the loop to try and make this stuff work which it might do mm -hmm. then it's never going to work again it's a bit like you know we were talking about how you approach the interface if you approach the interface of cognition 
and perception and you prod it uh, with a view to prodding the phenomenon, the phenomenon is going to prod you back. If you approach this technology with a view of, I'm going to keep it close held, I'm going to look on it as a weapon, um, maybe it's not going to give up its secrets. Hmm. So, you know, that's what we're, I think that's what we're dealing with. It's Again, it's double-edged, but we've got to find a way around it if we are going to survive, in my opinion, as a species going forward. Final thought to you, Marquise, before we ask Nick about uh, where people can find him. You got any last questions, brother? Um, I know we got a I, thousand, I, but we're yeah. There if I time. if I do we'll that, if I do that, that, I don't I don't want to. I know that if I ask any more questions, I'll just it, it could extend. I don't want to do that to you. I, I want to respect your time, so I just want to thank you. Um, this is awesome. I I do hope that we get another chance to talk to you because we. I definitely have more questions, just to get your mind, uh, your thoughts on things, and, and get your perspective on them. Um, but I really appreciate your perspective specifically when you mentioned early, uh, at the very beginning, you gave an analogy of consci like how consciousness or why that interface is important. That changes my perspective. Um, I didn't even think about this idea of an interface. And not only that, but when you relate it to technology, the computer interface that resonates with me because I'm a tech, I'm a very techie guy, um, that really changed my perspective. I appreciate that. So that's, that's all I want to say. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you both. I mean, I've really enjoyed the conversation. And, and it's interesting, Marquise, you pick up on, about the interface thing. Because, again, you know, I, I'm not a scientist, so I have to work with metaphors. I have to work for metaphors that enable me to understand or help me to understand things that are fundamentally not understandable. Mm. You know, and consciousness is not understandable. Um, reality as well, the nature of reality, is really hard to penetrate and ultimately may be non-understandable as well. So these metaphors for me, like Donald mm -hmm. Hoffman's interface, become really important. There is another one. It's not dissimilar, but it's a slightly different take on Donald Hoffman's, which comes from a guy, uh, another uh, guy I respect greatly, called Bernardo Castro. Um, mm -hmm. Bernardo is a ph philosopher, and he's also a computer scientist. His analogy is sort of similar but we experience reality much as a pilot or a, a, a flight crew on an aircraft experiences the environment outside of the aircraft through the instrument panel of the plane. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine if you're in a flying through the night, you rely on your instruments for the instruments you know, to tell you what is going on outside the aircraft. You're not di directly interfacing with the weather systems, with the atmospheric conditions, mm. the wind conditions outside the aircraft, you're interfacing with the instruments. And that, he says, is analogous to how we interpret reality. We are gaining a picture of our reality, a very filtered view uh, uh, through our in these instruments, because if we got the whole picture, it would blow our minds. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. Because there's so much reality out there mm -hmm. that it would literally just blow our minds. So evolution has given us this filtering that gives us all only and all the reality we need and no more. Because if we experienced nature, you know, the nature of reality in all its fullness, we would just, you know, I mean, it would just, it would, it would so freak us out we would never be able to function yeah. so yeah. i like those two analogies there's donald hoffman's which is the computer screen there's bernardo castrop's which is the aircraft instrumentation panel and i think for me they both work really effectively to describe how we as humanity interface with uh reality yeah. i've I got a are... comment yeah one more comment on that so that i was thinking when you said that 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 maybe maybe insanity is you know is the is a consequence of the veil disseminating and uh and and of course the the true nature of reality being fully realized maybe the insane people know the truth and um brain we'll can't handle it <laughs> well you know i mean i am sure that we will learn things about ourselves going forward you know in which perhaps some you know previously di diagnosed mental illnesses will be deemed not to have been uh, mental illnesses at all, but just huh? a broader perception of reality, for sure. Yeah. yeah. 
Well said. And Nick, where can people learn more about you, your work, your books? Uh, well, I've got a website, which is uh, uh, nickcook.works. Um, I've got, uh, I'm on Twitter occasionally. I'm not, a, you know, I'm, I'm trying to do a little bit more on uh, X. Um, I, that's uh, at I am Nick Cook. Um, my books are out there. Um, the Hunt for Zero Point is available, you know, through all good bookstores and um, online outlets. Uh, so, yeah, you know, just I'm around. Awesome. And we really appreciate your time today. We know we got to let you go. We'd love to do a part two someday if you have some time. I know you've uh, been busy recently with uh, Ross Coltart and other shows. So thank you for taking the time to come on our show. Uh, you're always a welcome yeah. friend here. And uh, if everybody in has enjoyed this episode, give us a thumbs up. If you haven't yet subscribed to our channels, please do so. We are on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and the UnX network as well. And uh, with that, we'll bring today's show to a close. I want to thank uh, our distinguished guest, Mr. Nick Cook. And on behalf of Marquise Williams and myself, Louis Borges, thank you everybody for joining us today. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>